Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Dark and Stormy Nights. This is Loki. This is Tyr. And we've got another exciting episode for you. This week, Tyr brings you a titillating tale <coughs> of... Craziness. Craziness. <laughs> craziness. We'll go with that. Uh, so, full... Yeah, there's a disclaimer on this chapter, because it kind of admittedly got away from me big time. Um, and, and if you'll remember... This chapter was the part where all of the um, the uprising, the rebellion, is pulling the hunters away from the huntsmen, right? And since we had discussed the fact that the the rebellion is mostly the younger generation, so teens and young adults, um, <clears throat> I tried to do things that teens and young adults would find funny uh, or, you know, choose to do. And... Um, as such, I got the opinions of my own teens and young adults. <laughs> and then I, you know, went online and looked around for inspiration on social media and memes. And it snowballed and it's ridiculous. <laughs> 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 but <clears throat> whatever, we can tweak it and tone it down as much as you want. But it is going to be kind of a, a little bit of an off the rails. Okay. Chapter. Well, I look forward to uh, <coughs> to hearing this madness. Okay, so do you want me to just jump right in? Yeah, are you going to split it or are you going to go you straight know, through? It's it's a pretty long chapter, like 10, 11 pages. Yeah. So. There we go. I think we're, I think it takes care of some of the buzz. I mean, <coughs> I guess I can try to cut it off. You know what? Uh, you do you and we'll just roll with it. I'm just going to pick a cutting spot somewhere like halfway through and and we'll we'll split it there. Okay. Even if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Lee. Hey kid, hand me that book on summoning. It's right over uh Lee looked around at the piles of books scattered through the lobby of the huntsman. Uh somewhere in that general vicinity. He finished waving a hand at pretty much the entire lobby. Yeah, that's so helpful, Lee. I'm not your lap dog, you know, Elliot grumbled. Lee, damn it, Nigel, I'm busy here. I need you to take a job. And I already told you I'm busy. Send someone else. Nigel sighed. I already did. Then what the hell's the problem? That was three calls ago, Lee. I sent Jake to deal with the dog-sized rats downtown. Winston's handling the haunted fog rolling off the lake. And Daphne went after the pack of great talking great names. Sounds like someone's messing with you. Or dealing a bad batch of drugs. There's one problem with that theory. Nigel plucked the black and white tube TV off of his back counter and dropped it onto the counter facing the lobby. My dealer's out of town this week. The screen flickered and faded into a news report. We've spoken to quite a few people in the crowd, <coughs> and no one knows exactly where these masked men came from. The man in the silver mask, who goes by the name Subterfuge, arrived, disrupting the locals and with his loud and disorderly be behavior. I'm told that shortly after his arrival, the other masked figure, Commander Canada, appeared, attempting to de-escalate the situation. As you can see, things are starting to get heated. The camera zoomed in as the two men circled each other in a ridiculous spectacle of stereotypical behavior. One man in red and white spandex brandished his hockey stick in an almost threatening way, while the other, <coughs> with what looked like a tinfoil hat that came down to over his eyes to double as a mask, seemed to prefer words as his weapons. Enough subterfuge. Your antics have disrupted everyone's day. Take your paranoia back to the chat rooms, eh? What are you going to do about it, Commander? <coughs> Tie me to a windmill until it causes brain damage? Sick your buddy Bigfoot on me? Commander Canada clenched his teeth. Windmills don't cause damage and you know it. Subterfuge threw his head back in a villainous laugh. You people are sheep. Don't you know about the windmills and the 5G? <laughs> They're lying to you. The earth is flat. The commander's eyes widened. You take that back, he hissed. What the hell am I watching, Elliot murmured. <coughs> Lee shook his head slowly. I stand by my drug theory. They watched the screen as Subterfuge stepped closer to his nemesis. Do I need to tell you about the moon landing? Commander Canada's fingers tightened on his hockey stick. Don't. You. Dare. Never happened, the villain snarled. You've gone too far. It was apparently the last straw for the commander <coughs> as he swung his hockey stick, attempting to hook the legs of his enemy. But Subterfuge was too sly for such an obvious move, and he leapt into the air, hovering above the ground. His cape, which looked to be made out of magazine clippings, held together with pins and red string, flared out behind him. I'll never bow to you. The Illuminati have brainwashed you all. 
that's it. I'm taking you in. The commander holstered his hockey stick on his back <clears throat> and held up his hands. I'm giving you one last chance to come peacefully. Why? So your government can stop me from spreading the truth about Loch Ness? Over my cold, dead, microchipped body. Lee, I'm scared, Elliot complained. Yeah, me too, kid. I didn't want to have to do this, Commander Canada announced. But you've given me no choice. Brown goo flew from his hands, shackling subterfuge's wrists. The villain panicked, flying recklessly above the crowd as he attempted to pull his wrists apart. The crowd ducked, diving out of the path of the superheroes. Did he just shoot pancake syrup from his wrists or from his hands? Elliot asked. <coughs> Nigel cleared his throat. Real maple syrup, I'm sure. <laughs> and I need you to take this one. Lee grimaced. That's clear across town, Nigel. I'm in the middle of a case. One that you put me on in the first place. We're already low on men, and those that we have already have cases. Or already on cases. So am I. The bell sounded over the door, and Rick walked into the lobby. He paused, taking in the mess. What the hell's going on here? Rick can take the case, Lee announced triumphantly. What case? That one. Lee pointed to the superhero fight on the TV screen. Subterfuge had landed in a nearby fountain, washing off enough of the syrup to release his wrists. He ducked into the crowd, and the following shots took down some innocent bystanders and caused some sticky property damage. Turn yourself in, Subterfuge. You're trying to hand me over to the lizard people, he shouted hysterically. Rick squinted at the TV like his brain was about to explode. What the f- Can you take the case, Rick? Nigel interrupted. Rick turned his glare on Lee. Well, Nigel, I'd love to take a case, but my car happens to be Ash. Any idea how that happened? Lee shrugged and plucked a set of keys from beside him on the lobby love seat. That's a tough break, Rick. Here, take this one. He tossed the keys uh, across the lobby, and Rick held them up, eyeing the dangling keychain that looked like a bobblehead of Rick Astley. Whose car is this? Hmm? Uh, oh, it's a loner. Just fill up the tank while you're out, would ya? <coughs> Elliot covered a laugh at the th vein that was throbbing in Rick's forehead. You cannot be serious. Better get down there. That fight's getting messy, Lee interrupted. The hunter glanced at the TV in time to see subterfuge flinging his power about, causing confusion and general delirium in anyone he hit. Rick snarled and shoved out the door. We're going to have a talk about my car when I get back. Sure thing, bud, Lee murmured, not bothering to look up from his book. Whose car did you give him, Elliot asked, as they went back to digging through the piles. Lee snorted. No clue. Those keys were there when I got here. Think someone forgot them. Nigel reached over the counter to answer the ringing phone again. When he brushed the TV, wavy lines appeared before fading into a new picture. Elliot's eyes widened at the black cloud that moved rapidly through the sky, nearly blocking out the sun with its size. That doesn't look good, he murmured, inching closer to the screen to get a better view of whatever darkness was taking over the city. The cloud swirled above the building before darting closer, and it wasn't until it moved in close that Elliot realized it wasn't a cloud at all. It was a swarm. Are those locusts? Nigel's eyes jumped to the screen. Jake, forget the rats. We'll spin a story about a sewer flood in New York driving them here. I'm sending you to a new location now. Uh, yeah, you'll know when you see it. I'll send back up as soon as someone is free. Good luck. Nigel quickly hung up the phone before flipping through an ancient card Rolodex behind the counter. Elliot shuddered as at, the, at the masses of insects forced an artificial night on the people below. Those that wandered out to see what was happening quickly dashed back inside. The picture grew staticky, and he fiddled with the rabbit ear antennas. Rather than clear the picture, it changed completely. This time, nothing bad was happening. It was... Uh, video of a town center where the city was having some sort of festival. Elliot had just reached for the antenna again when something caught his eye. One of the festival goers was bleeding and limping. She hobbled into the crowd who quickly moved out of the way. Panic took hold for a moment as more injured and bleeding patrons found their way forward. Blood poured from bullet holes and heads hung from broken necks, but just as about as he was about to call over a very frustrated Nigel, music started and the crowd let out a relieved laugh almost as one. A flash mob, someone said excitedly. And within seconds, any cell phones that hadn't already been recording were out, catching the dancing characters. <coughs> but as the jerky moves grew faster, the crowd grew horrified as the decomposing bodies proved unable to handle the abuse. The body parts started coming loose. Eyeballs dangled, and teeth fell from their mouths, and still the bodies danced. Nearly severed limbs gave up the fight to stay attached, and still the bodies danced. A scream drowned out the music as one of the heads snapped off and was kicked into the crowd by the next zombie, 
who couldn't stop his show even for a stumbling headless body next to him, and still they danced. Lee? This time it was Elliot calling for him, but the intent was the same. Someone's going to want to handle this. Busy, Lee grunted. Uh, Nigel? The normally unruffable man held up a finger as he frantically flipped through a million cards. He ran one hand through his mullet uh, when he came to the end seemingly without finding what he was looking for. Nigel? He straightened suddenly, tapping his fingers on the counter. The images on the screen flickered through different events with every tap. Did I throw it out? He asked no one in particular. It has been a long time, and there was that disagreement. Elliot's eyebrows rose on his forehead as Nigel carried on a full conversation with himself. For God's sake, Nigel, just check again. You probably missed it flipping through the cards like a madman. Nigel blinked at Lee like he'd forgotten he had an audience. Right, he agreed, smoothing down the front of his robe. I'm sure I just missed it. <coughs> the man started over, inspecting the cards more carefully this time. Elliot turned his attention back to the TV screen, which had landed on a weather report being broadcast from the metro parks near some downed trees. He let out a relieved breath at the mundane story about the thunderstorms they'd had the past weekend. A young pedestrian passed behind the, mic the weatherman, pausing on camera to get his few moments of fame. Elliot chuckled as the guy w mouthed the words, Hi, Mom, and then sipped his brightly col colored bre beverage. His laughter was cut short when both the passerby and the weatherman's head snapped around to look at a large patch of trees. Elliot couldn't see anything, but something had clearly caught their attention. The weatherman touched his earpiece. I'm not sure if the microphones are picking this up, but we're hearing some kind of noise. It sounds like trees are falling, and there's a thumping. It's almost rhythmic. The weatherman and the bystander turned their eyes to the drink still clutched in the man's hand. There was a tense moment of silence, and then the liquid in the cup rippled as the pounding resumed. They stood in stunned silence as it happened twice more, growing louder. The sound of the snapping branches uh, sounded in the distance, and finally the younger man had had enough. He thrust his cup at the reporter. Oh, hell no. I saw this movie. I'm not about to get eaten. The guy disappeared in a flash, and the reporter looked tempted to follow. But after a moment of hesitation, he resigned himself to finishing the job. <coughs> right. Um, we're going to try to get a better angle here, he said, as he started backing away and picking up speed. We'll see if we can find some higher ground or a better viewpoint. The camera bounced as they tried to outrun whatever was moving in. But when the trees in view started toppling, the cameraman froze in shock. For a second, Elliot had a clear view of something huge about to break through the tree line. But then the camera angle dropped and he saw nothing but grass. Elliot shifted as if moving would give him a better view of whatever was no longer being filmed. Oh my god, the cameraman muttered loud enough to be picked up by the mics. We can pause there. Okay. I know that's kind of an awkward spot to pause, but... Is that, like a good place for you to pause? I mean, it's fine. We'll just pick it right back up at that same place. Well, it doesn't seem too off the rails yet. I mean, I thought the superhero fight was like a little ridiculous. Yeah, but I mean, if they're if they're casting, I mean, it's either charms or it's actually, it could be two of the, the you know, the Fae themselves or whatever like that acting mm -hmm. this out and stuff, you know, um, to, yeah, to no, cause just problems. Yeah, taking the inspiration from the internet on that one. Yeah. No, I love the maple syrup cuffs <laughs> and stuff like that. I almost did it's like totally a, what a Canadian superhero would have. I, I think. know, and I almost did like a K-pop um, superhero instead of Commander Canada, but obviously the stereotypes. The only thing I think I would have added is like maybe Commander Canada offering uh, free health care to <laughs> Captain Subterfuge if he turned himself in. Um, yeah, the Canadian thing was just too easy to do with the stereotypes, you know, so mm. I stuck with it. So, yeah. Well, it, you know, if it's based on the internet at all or whatever, you know, of course it's all about stereotypes. Right. So, so. yeah, I thought it was funny. Um, no, yeah, so far, not too far off the rails. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, you want to take a break and come back? Yep, sounds good. Okay. Hey, dames and knights, Loki requires attention to survive. We feed him your likes and comments, so go show some love at the Dark and Stormy K1 on Twitter, the Dark and Stormy Nights .home .blog, or you can find us at Podbean, iTunes, or Google Play Music. Love me. Love me. Love. And we're back. Are you ready for the second half of this story? You want me to just jump right back in? Jump right in. Okay. Oh my god, the ca cameraman muttered loud enough to be picked up by the mics. Pick the camera up, Elliot whined, wanting to see the dinosaur. 
Mark, can you tell us what, are, what you're seeing? The news station tried to reach um, out to their long-gone weatherman. Finally prompted into action, the camera jostled and then swung up to take in the monstrosity that had sent grown men running. It wasn't a dinosaur, as Elliot had expected, but he was far from disappointed by the dinosaur-sized platypus that had emer emerged from the trees and made a beeline for the creek. The creek that he most definitely did not fit in, but that didn't stop him from mowing down signs and picnic tables along the way, to only to settle the bottom of his belly in the water. Elliot considered letting Nigel know, but after one glance at the frazzled man grumbling to himself as he dug through index cards like a caveman uh, that had never heard of a cell phone, he figured that in the grand scheme of things, dinosaur platypus could wait. Aha, there it is. Nigel plucked a card from the Rolodex and stepped away, punching uh, the contact information into his phone. The TV screen again changed, and this time a screaming crowd uh, was scrambling to get away from a monster that looked like the love child of Cerberus and Cthulhu. The beast hung its he uh, swung its head to one side, drool and tentacles flew, narrowly missing the escaped villains. I'm sorry, escaping civilians. Um, uh, Lee, this one can't wait. Finally, Lee looked up and grimaced at the creature on the screen. Uh, Winston's already out in that area. I'll give him a call and send him over there. Elliot shook his head and turned his attention back to Nigel, who paced while he tried to convince whoever he was on the phone with that they needed to get there fast. What the hell is happening, he murmured to himself. <clears throat> Nigel huffed and pinched his nose. Yes, I remember quite well, Caspian, but I wouldn't have called if this wasn't urgent. His fingers tightened on the phone. If magic, magic is exposed to the humans, it will end just as badly for you as anyone else. He shook his head. We settled that a century ago. Nigel's whole body tensed at whatever Cas Caspian had said. That's ridiculous. It happened more than a hundred years ago, and I still don't think... Nigel's words were cut off by a loud screech on the TV screen. A red dragon swooped through the air, circling the terminal tower. Nigel grimaced and then deflated. Returning to his phone call. Fine, if I must be the bigger person, I'm sorry for something that happened last century and was hardly my fault. You got your apology, now get here and fix this. And Caspian, bring the whole team. Something's going down and all hell is breaking loose. Nigel hung up the phone <clears throat> and turned to find Lee and Elliot staring. He brushed some lint off the sleeve of his robe and straightened. An old acquaintance. Lee arched an eyebrow and Elliot couldn't help but agree with the sentiment. Sounded like more than a, an acquaintance to him as well, but Nigel didn't seem inclined to discuss it. Instead, he looked to the screen again. Lee? Still busy, Nigel. And has it occurred to you that whatever is causing all this is trying to keep me from getting these answers? Nigel huffed. Really, Lee? You think that all of this is going on to get your nose out of the book? All they'd have to do is tell you there's a two-for-one drinks over at the Humpsman. <laughs> that got Lee's attention. Is there? <laughs> Jesus, no! Deal with the dragon and I'll buy you all the drinks you want. <clears throat> Elliot stared at the screen, completely fascinated. I'll do it, he volunteered. Not exactly a starter job, kid. Not unless you're sitting on a pile of treasure you can lure it out with. Dragons are old, loyal to few, and tough negotiators. Negotiators? We don't even know if it's real, Nigel pointed out. It could be an illusion. They moved closer to the screen, watching as the dragon attempted to land above the observation deck and accidentally snapped off the flagpole on top of the building. The creature looked a little sheepish as he tried to stick it back on top of the building before giving, it up, <laughs> giving up and tucking it inside the viewing area. A puff of smoke enveloped the dragon, and when it cleared, it was small enough to perch on the railing of the observation deck. I'm going with real, Lee decided. It should be you that handles negotiations, Nigel. You're the only one that would have anything he wants. They can change size? Nigel shook his head, ignoring Elliot's question. As, ridicu as ridiculous as your theory is, I don't argue the fact that they're trying to draw us out. I think I need to stay here. Not going, Nigel, Lee grunted. Shit's going down here, and I'm not going to be off with distractions when the boat act shows up. Finally, Nigel turned to Elliot. <coughs> Call me as soon as you get there. I'll handle the negotiating through you. Do not agree to anything until you have me on the phone. You're really going to send him on his own. What choice do we have? Are you going to go with him? Lee looked out the door at the darkness beyond before shaking his head. I got a feeling. Then it looks like he's getting fast-tracked to his first solo mission. Lee sighed and gave Elliot a stern look. Don't do anything stupid, kid. Follow Nigel's instructions exactly and don't try to outsmart it. Dragons aren't from our world, but don't mistake culture shock for ignorance. They are timeless, ancient, and they have a ton of magic. 
You won't force it to do something it doesn't want to. Negotiating a deal is the only option. Dragons are creatures of the old ways. Honor still means something to them. If you're respectful, probably won't eat you. Probably, Elliot squeaked. I mean, unless he's cranky. Or hungry. Just don't piss it off. Can they talk, he asked. Nigel nodded. Older dragons can communicate verbally. Younglings that haven't mastered the language can still communicate through mental nudges and images. As long as they're interested in speaking with you, you won't have a problem communicating. Lee doubled down on his research while Nigel covered a crash course in dragon negotiations and sent Elliot on his way. Think that was a good idea? Lee finally asked when the tense silence started getting to him. No, but if it's an illusion, it can't hurt him. And if it's real, it's not something the cleaners I called in will handle. Elliot has a pure soul. The dragon will see that. I wouldn't have sent him if I thought he'd be marching to his death. You better be right about that, Lee warned, feeling a little protective of the kid. Nigel's phone rang, and he immediately picked it up. Elliot, are you with him now? Okay, tell him you're a representative of the, sor a representative of the Sorcerer's Combine, and that you're there to negotiate on our behalf. What do you mean he doesn't want to negotiate? On vacation... Nigel put his phone on speaker, and Elliot's voice filled the lobby. Got to agree, Rumiel. This isn't exactly an ideal vacation spot. Have you looked into the Galapagos Islands? It's a way better bet. Exotic, beautiful beaches, nature. A low grumble sounded. I have not heard of this exotic land of Galapagos. The travel agent assured me that this was the best vacation spot. They said it was lit. There are indeed many lights here, but I'm still unsure why this is desirable in a de travel destination. Nigel arched one eyebrow and mouthed the words travel agent at Lee. Romiel, what are your terms for returning to your home? I have no need of terms for returning home as I've long awaited this vacation and do not intend to return until it's over. Nigel muted the phone. <clears throat> We should consider the possibility that I've been placed in a magically induced coma and this is all a hallucination. Then we're screwed because I'm here, stuck here with you, and I was probably your only hope for getting out of it alive. <coughs> Nigel nodded and pressed the button on the phone again. What if we can negotiate a different vacation and you can return home for now and we'll set up a better vacation soon? I cannot just change plans on a whim. Arrangements must be made. Elliot hummed. Sure, I mean, you're clearly an important dragon. You must have a treasure and a schedule and a place to maintain. But surely a dragon as important as yourself has an assistant to help out, one that could cover your responsibilities while you're on vacation. You're a smart human. Dragons have much to attend to, but we do not have assistants. Are you offering yourself as my assistant, human? Uh, no. I have to stay here. But maybe I can help with your schedule or something So from here so you can take your vacation. Elliot, Nigel warned softly, but he didn't stop him altogether because honestly the kid was doing better than he was. The, dranget, the dragon rumbled as he thought it over. Yes, I'm willing to consider your terms. I will move my vacation to another location and you shall remain here to watch my niece. What? Whoa, I'm not sure that'll work. Of course it will work. The youngling is much smaller than a human. She will fit here fine. You want me to babysit your niece? For how long? Not long, human. A century. Maybe two. Elliot! Nigel urged more sharply, but his final warning came too late. The phone went dead, and the room was plunged into darkness. What the hell just happened, Lee demanded. Nigel felt a tug at his magic, and he dropped his glamour, focusing his magic inward. I think the hallucination option is starting to look better and better. He slammed his staff on the ground, attempting to tap into the magical alarm system. <clears throat> the magic flared out of the staff and into the spell weaving. The warning system lit up but fizzled as the weaving unraveled and ripped apart. Withdrawing his magic from the security, he turned back to the TV, using his staff to bring it back to life. <clears throat> this time, instead of various parts of the city, the screen showed the outside of the huntsman. Flares of magic rippled across the outside of the building like lightning, breaking holes in the illusion. Nigel tensed and then flew into action. He aimed his staff above him, firing off a wave of magic into the building above, and then extended his arms to either side. His lips moved with the words of his spell, and his eyes, glowed, his eyes glowed from beneath his partially closed lids. Lee turned his attention out the door, in time to see dark figures emerging from the surroundings. Not one to hesitate, he pulled his gun and stormed towards the door. 
but it lit up with an electric current as he reached for it. Bolts of magic rippled across the surface, across the surface, giving way to something that was definitely not the huntsman underneath. Lee spun to see Nigel straining beneath the effort of his magic. His attention turned back to the TV screen as the figure surrounded the building. Lee sent out a message to other hunters directing them to get back, but he knew the distractions had worked and they wouldn't be able to return in time. His eyes scanned the figures, but none looked to be the Bodak as he'd expected. Most looked like young witches, some fae, various magical other. Who the hell are they? Nigel collapsed under the exertion of fighting several covens at once, witches, he murmured weakly, as the magic collapsed next. Breaking away with no one left to protect it, the huntsman crumbled, revealing a pristine lobby that was a far cry from what Lee had grown used to. What the hell? How do they have that much power? Nigel climbed to his feet and made his way out the door like every step caused him pain. A crowd had gathered behind the witches, and every head was turned up, taking what had always been hidden from them. Lee turned to see what everyone was looking at, and then stepped back, his neck craning to take in the enormity of the sorcerer's tower. Jesus Christ, was that always there? Nigel ignored Lee, choosing instead to address the witches. What is, your, what is it you plan to accomplish with this? Lee thought the sorcerer was being a little ballsy for someone who'd just been bested by these coffins. But when more sorcerers began fil filing out of the huntsman, or the sorcerer's tower, he realized he could afford to be a little cocky. He took a moment to settle a glare on the sorcerer he recognized. The nightmares the man's dead wife had left in his head was, were haunting, and Lee was still pretty pissed off about it. Having someone else's torture planted in his brain was ten kinds of messed up, and it wasn't an experience he ever wanted to have again. He turned back to the witches, expecting to see some semblance of fear in them. That many sorcerers were nothing to scoff at. But, um, and even Lee had inched away, not wanting to get caught in any crossfire. But there was no fear in the witches. If anything, their eyes burned with anger. Lee took another step away, just in case. <clears throat> the night lit up behind the circle of witches, and Lee noticed some of the crowd trying to get through the barrier with no success. He'd bet that nothing was getting out either, and suddenly his plan to stick around seemed like less of a good idea. The light grew blinding, and then in a flash it disappeared, leaving three witches in its wake. Lee blinked at their attire and then cringed when he realized what it meant and why these witches were so powerful. Powerful enough to make the sorcerers nervous, though one still stepped forward. You have violated too many rules to count and endangered all of us. Hatred burned in these witches' eyes, and their words drift with malice. It is you that has endangered us all. You have been exposed. The communities no longer answer to you. Lee's gaze was drawn away from the face, uh, from the face off when a red dragon flew overhead and circled the sorcerer's tower. When it swooped around again, Lee could just make out Elliot on the creature's back, and he rubbed at the pressure forming behind his eye. <clears throat> The witches glanced up, but didn't react to the newcomer. One turned to face the crowd. The sorcerers have committed abhorrent acts, and we will no longer accept their oppression. From here forward, we claim our true place as equals. Another witch spoke to the sorcerers directly. Any further attempt to wield the power you have stolen will be met with the same mercy you have shown us. This is your only warning. A crack of magic popped in his ears, and the same blinding light they'd shown up in lit up the entire area like he'd been dropped on the sun. And with it came the memories. Lee dropped to his knees and clutched his head as the visions assaulted his brain. A wave of agony shook his body, and he relived every moment of the witch trials, their origins, their intent, their perpetrators. When it was finally over, <clears throat> the only ones who remained were the sorcerers and the bounty hunters who'd returned but hadn't been able to make it through the barrier. The haunted look in their eyes told Lee that the history lesson had been broadcast to the entire crowd, and when some of them turned their backs and walked away, he'd never emptied their freedom more. Okay. That was good. Thank you. I, think, I mean, the dragon was the most far-fetched part of it, mm -hmm. but, uh, but other than that, I mean... Uh, it's an interesting tool in the toolbox. Yeah, I mean, I figured he could have... 
a loose alliance with the older dragon that he was speaking with. Right. Um, and then, I mean, as far as babysitting the niece we don't have the negotiation that he completed on his own. Right. So it could be anything from like, he now has a small, like cat sized or dog sized dragon okay, hear me to out. babysit for a week or it could be a century. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm thinking like, I mean, are they full shape shifters or is it just size shifting? So here's the thing is that I said, I did say a, he could shift size, and B, he has a ton of magic. Right. So they could put an illusion on this thing to actually have it walk like a dog on a leash, which I don't know that a dragon would be okay with. Or they could put on a le- put on an illusion to make her look like a small child. Or he could just... Well, I mean, she could make herself invisible, and he can keep her on his how shoulder. How old is young for a dragon? You know what I'm saying? I mean, but that's the thing is that they... I made it sound like they age so slowly... That she'll be as young as we want her to be for as long as we need her to be. Because I'm just thinking if she is like an annoying 19 year old or whatever like that. No, like, that's older. Oh my god, than I was let's thinking. take a selfie. Let's go to the club. Let's do this. I, and you know, to, to be honest, like when I was imagining it, I was thinking she would be much younger. Um, but like, you know, for a dragon, younger still means they've been alive long enough right. to have some wisdom and to you know to be able to control herself and not expose herself to humans. Um, But at the same time, like we don't even necessarily need to make her have language. Like I said, she could communicate through mental nudges or have some sort of telepathic link with, with Elliot. Sure. Um, I just figured there's a lot that we could do with her and having dragons as allies, you know, and we could either, like I said, have him have discussed, well, human terms for a vacation is like a week or two. And that's the only time he has this dragon and it's over quickly within the book. Or we can draw it out and he's agreed to several years with Dragon or something, you know, if we think she'll be helpful to have around. But, I mean, she has a ton of magic. She's an ally. The uncle is an ally, you know. So if he ever needs to draw out the big guns, he's literally got dragons on his side. Right. Interesting. Well, I can't wait to plan the next chapter, and uh, I guess we'll do that uh, next week. Yep. So don't forget to check us out. In the meantime, we are on Twitter at the Dark Stormy K one We are on Reddit. At r slash dark and stormy nights. We're on Facebook and any place you can find podcasts and YouTube. So go check us out there. Tier, do you guys do you have anything to, to mention? No, I don't really have anything new going on. Okay, wonderful. We'll see you next week. <laughs>